I think what's, uh, I do see it as an opportunity uh, to serve in government. I've, I've, ser you know, I've been in the legislature, I've been on the business side, uh, I've been on the NGO side, on the think tank side. So when an opportunity came up to join the government, I thought, well, um, yes, this will help me to complete my experience. Uh, and since I've spent years pointing my finger at, mm. at officials and saying you should be doing this and you should be doing that, uh, then now I have to do that myself and other people would be pointing their mm. finger at me. Um, and I, I, I agreed to join the government precisely because I think um, I should be able to do something. And during the first week, I joined the government on the 12th of September, and uh, a number of my, my colleagues in, in, in government, uh, I've known them for a while because, of course, I've been active in, in the environment, so you know, we've known each other uh, through you know, professional relationships with, with uh, now my colleagues. And they were very curious to know, after a few days, what I think. Because I, I think in their minds, they were probably thinking, you know, it's more constraining in government. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that. And there are layers of uh, administration. And, you know, there's uh, uh, functions quite differently. You know, when, you, when you're with the think tank and you can say what you want and do what you want, uh, well, what do you think now? Um, and what I said to them was, I said, I could see just in three days that the potential to do good is enormous, which is still how I see uh, my job today. And having been there for uh, a few months, um, I recognize in government, how, I mean, how government works, or at least how the Hong Kong government works. Uh, in the legislature, for example, where, where I spent nearly 10 years, um, Legislature works by everybody meeting and debating and arguing and then voting or not voting on something. Uh, in the administration, we have many meetings, we have many briefings, many meetings, and then <coughs> things are reduced down to paper. And for those of you who are lawyers, you know how important words are. Um, I do see, therefore, opportunities almost every day with looking through some document that just by even fine-tuning a sentence that it does make a difference to the end you know what to, to crystallizing a meeting that we've had to to framing or summarizing a decision that had been taken or some paper that you're looking through and you're thinking well if if we can change these two words it'll be better mm -hmm. and if people agree to change those two words actually it's quite a substantial change so, um, so as I said, I value these moments as much as uh, the sort of bigger moments where you go into the legislature and you try and get decisions actually accepted. Um, so that's how I spend my time uh, every day. The, the, the second issue is I'm very conscious that Hong Kong is a part of China. And in the area of the environment, uh, China has many challenges. I think up until now, a lot of people have looked at the environment from the point of view of, well, it's all coming from China. The, uh, therefore, it's hard to deal with pollution problems in Hong Kong. And one of the things I want very much to do, and I'm definitely actively doing every day, is to say, well, whilst that is true, the conclusion is not true. I mean, of course, there's a lot of pollution coming from the mainland, but Hong Kong is only a community of seven million people. We are a small city, and our, our immediate neighborhood is the Pearl River Delta. And as you know, the Pearl River Delta today still contributes about 10% of China's GDP because this is the thumping export production center of the world. And Guangdong province, which is our neighboring province, it still is the leading um, GDP uh, uh, producer, uh, generator, for China as a whole. So we should not be surprised that 
there is more emissions coming from our neighborhood than coming from a city of 7 million people. The Pearl River Delta has about 50 million people. As I said, we know it's a thumping industrial zone. So of course it's going to have more emissions. We are lucky in some ways because now people are very much focused on the north where we've had an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, several episodes in one month of very, very high pollution. And I remember, I think it was two years ago, when uh, up in Beijing, the pollution was so bad that I think for the first time, flights were canceled and you, you know even people were concerned about driving because they couldn't <coughs> quite see, visibility was so bad. I think this came as a very major shock for the people of China. Uh, they knew pollution was a problem, but I think people hadn't quite grasped that um, it could get so bad. And I think people have been learning about inversions and why you know the 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 uh, uh, it was possible to have this density of pollution. This month, uh, last month in January, because I think we had three episodes, uh, almost people were saying, well, almost the entire month we were having, having problems. Uh, this has come, I think, at a critical time. <coughs> this is also the transition time of the leadership in China. And my friends in Beijing tell me that they are debating, you know, what, what to do. And because I have been, um, very interested, particularly in air pollution, for a long time. I do know uh, that some of the leading scientists and the leading government advisors in this area. So, I mean, obviously, we've been communicating about how, how things are. And our communication is not just, of course, about how bad things are, but it is about what we can do, how we can help with the process. And one of the things that I do feel uh, in southern China, we have a uh, we have a, a, a special responsibility to contribute, because it is in Hong Kong and Guangdong province where we've started in the late 90s to develop a joint air monitoring system, and this is the leading system in China. So, national uh, leaders who are working in the environment, uh, if if some province or some area wants to create uh, a good air monitoring system, generally they will say, well, look at the Hong Kong and Guangdong monitoring system. So I feel that uh, the officials in Hong Kong and Guangdong, in many ways, they're quite proud of what they've done. And again, there has been a, a, a very positive move very recently in China becoming much more open with pollution data. And you can, you know, it just in the last year, China has progressively released data. They now, they've now, they're now requiring cities to uh, release the data. And I remember just a few years ago, uh, it was still considered a secret uh, to release air pollution data. So I, I do see that uh, China has moved ahead very quickly. Now, Knowing some of the debates that are going on amongst the experts in China about air pollution, um, I, I get a sense that uh, the new leadership, they, they will have to uh, give air pollution a very high priority in their policies. Uh, I mean, this has come not a moment too soon. Now, in southern China, because we have developed a air monitoring system that is ahead of the of of, of the, the the national uh, system, um, because Hong Kong and Guangdong have done joint studies, I do feel that our experience can lend something to the national discussion. I mean, of course, we must practice that ourselves. It the uh, the collaboration, the continuing collaboration between Hong Kong and Guangdong to do the science, to discuss control, and between Hong Kong and Guangdong, we actually have agreed reduction targets. So again, I think this is new in China. Uh, in, uh, in fact, the first time 
that Hong Kong and Guangdong, the two governments, had uh, agreed to targets was 10 years ago. So uh, in those days, we, we agreed on a target we have to achieve uh, this much and they have to achieve this much. In 2010, we, we looked at what we have done uh, and now we have extended our targets to 2015 and 2020. I'm not sure, I, I mean, I may be wrong on this, I'm not sure whether there are provinces or different parts of China who've agreed with each other to have reduction targets. Um, now, we're having reduction targets as a region. And I think this is what is also special about Hong Kong. We were able in 1999 to start a discussion with China, to, uh, uh, with Guangdong, to have set reduction targets. I think precisely because Hong Kong is a little different. And at that time, the chief executive was C.H. Tong, who I know is also a friend uh, of, of, of the council. Uh, he was the one who broke through uh, uh, the, you know, I guess the Hong Kong-China experience. Uh, well, the big breakthrough was 1997, of course. And in air pollution, Mr. Tong, I thought, took a very uh, major step by reaching agreement with the Guangdong government to set up the joint monitoring station and to have a joint target for emissions reduction. So now that we have 10 years, we can look back at the experience and, and we're continuing to collaborate with Guangdong. I really think that's a very special case in, in China. So I treasure that experience. I know how important that is. I know that this experience can be taken further, even beyond Guangdong, to see how we can add to the national debate uh, and solution seeking for dealing with, with air pollution. Now there's another thing where I think the Hong Kong factor uh, is important. Um, and this is about managing ports and ships. Now the story for Hong Kong actually begins in Long Beach in California. I think it was in 2006 uh, when a U.S. report was published about the significant negative health impacts for people who live around ports. Um, because the large ships, they do burn a much dirtier fuel called bunker fuel, and this has an impact on the people who live around the port. And I remember when I read that report, I mean, I was then with the think tank, I thought, gosh, uh, for, for us coming from Asia, you know, Long Beach have no people. Um, and, <laughs> and I was thinking, if we, if we took uh, what, what the report said about the impacts on people, then in Asian ports, in my city, in Hong Kong, the density of the population, the number of ships are just much, much greater. So I thought, well, the impact, therefore, the health impact on our people was much higher. And at that time, one of the US NGOs was, uh, was going to sue the port of Long Beach for, for this. And as I watched this unfold, uh, I saw that Long Beach decided, rather than you know, go head to head and fight the case, they, they embarked on a voluntary plan to comprehensively clean up shipping and ports. And at that time, I thought, well, you know, this is the most comprehensive clean port uh, effort that I had seen. And very quickly, those ideas of what you could do and what you must do uh, spread to Europe. So Rotterdam and some of the European Union ports began to look at it, and I think ports in Canada, uh, Seattle, and other US ports started to look at what Long Beach was doing as well. So at that time, I went to uh, the previous minister for the environment in Hong Kong, and I said, hmm, ships, you know, us, um, what do we do? And he said, well, um, ships is not on my radar screen. You know, I've got these other things that, that are really urgent. 
Uh, and and th at that time, I said, well, you know, for our think tank, let us try and do the running on this. Let me see what it is that we can do, whether we can bring the shipping and port sector together to see if we can, um, you know, do something. Um, but I'd like to think that once we were able to get some traction, uh, if we were able to get traction from the industry, that the government would join the discussion. And at that time, of course, I wasn't quite sure what we could achieve. Um, we raised some money uh, from uh, one of the local foundations and we started a series of uh, engagements with the shipping sector, the port sectors, the terminal operators, and ferry companies, and so on. And we found that uh, people, a lot of people were, were, were unaware of the impact of shipping emissions. But the big, uh, but the major companies that sailed across the Pacific and sailed to, uh, and sailed to Europe, they did know, because by then, the, uh, uh, for example, California, they had put, uh, and this is the government, you know, they had come up with much tougher policies. So, so when a ship sailed across from China, from Hong Kong, to the port of Long Beach or Los Angeles, well, they needed to do quite a few things. So when the ship came back to our side of the world, because we didn't require them to do anything, they didn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. So our, our discussion as an NGO was, well, are you willing to do something voluntarily, you know, or uh, could, you, could you foresee that you might be willing to, to adopt some of those things that you're doing in California and, you know, do it in Hong Kong? And there was a lot of umming and eye. <laughs> well, but at that stage, we, we were able to get the people from the business to sit together and at least discuss it. So the last minister, he kept his promise. He started to send his officials. And at that time, I thought, well, since the officials are here, why don't you say that you're thinking about regulation? Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's a long way if you're thinking to actually doing it. And their presence sort of gave that impression. And when the shipping sector thought, well, you know, if, if government is thinking about it or could be thinking about it, well, we better, uh, we, 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 we better, better step up. We, we better step up. So in their minds, they, they thought rightly that if you're going to set a new policy, we want to be there to help shape it. Because what they didn't want, I mean, quite rightly, is that we'll, we'll sell across the Pacific and they have one set of policies and you know, you're gonna have some other set of policies. You know, if we, can, if, we can, if we can have similar policies, that would be so much better. So that was the basis. And there was a, you know, sometimes in life there are magical moments. And a magical moment happened in one of these sort of gatherings where one of the ship, in 2010, where one of the ship companies put his hand up and said, well look, um, why don't, when, when our ships sail into Hong Kong and when we berth in Hong Kong, we will voluntarily switch fuels to a cleaner fuel. We'll pay for it ourselves. And because one company put their hand up, a couple more put their hand up. And that really changed the whole discussion. So they then said, we want the government to regulate because then it would create a level playing field and this is the right thing to do. Yeah. So the government was quite surprised because usually business don't tell you to regulate. They tell you not to regulate. Mm. So oh. this created a, a new, uh, uh, a kind of new dynamic. Well, fast forward, change of government, and I'm now here. Mm. And in a way, there is this coalition, this alliance of government, NGO, and the business sector that actually we've been working together for a number of years. So today, um, the government is able to work with the industry to now think about legis legislating, the mandating of uh, ships when they come in, when they birth, they switch to a cleaner fuel. So we've met, our chief executive has now announced this as part of his policy. We're now consulting the industry about how to draft the legislation. and Hopefully next year we'll pass the legislation and Hong Kong will be the first jurisdiction in Asia to do so. In fact, it will be the first jurisdiction outside Northern, uh, North America and the European Union to do so. Now, we had always said that we actually have a bigger vision because, you know, I mean, Hong Kong, our jurisdictional water is actually quite narrow. And if we wanted to have the full health benefits, 
And we were thinking about our sister port, which is in Shenzhen, because it's just so close together, then health benefits for us is also health benefits for them. So our vision is to is for the whole of the water of the Po River Delta to become really a low emission zone. Now, the last government, uh, because you know we were working together still when I was in, in the think tank, so they actually went to Beijing to ask Beijing, the Ministry of Transportation, whether something like this uh, could become a, 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 you know, a policy. Because not just Hong Kong, but Hong Kong and Guangdong. Uh, and the ministry sort of gave, gave their blessing. Uh, and when President Hu Jintao was in Hong Kong for the uh, 15th, uh, six, is it 16th, right, the, the, in June, last, last year, um, he, he, had a, he, he, he kind of had a list of uh, cooperation uh, of goodies, right, to, mm -hmm. to announce in Hong Kong. And one of the things is to work on shipping emissions. Um, so, so this is one, one project, it has a number of years, but we've cleared the hurdles sort of on the, on the national policy mindset, in a way have the highest uh, government backing in China, but of course the details have to be worked out between us and Guangdong. Now, I do think this is going to take some time to put in place, but again, I think it's possible to see that Hong Kong can have this impact of even a wider vision beyond just our own jurisdictional water. And I know that you probably had other people talk to you about you know, using Hong Kong as a financial center, the Renminbi internationalization. So I kind of see this port emissions thing as the equivalent of the Renminbi internationalization uh, in an environmental area. Because of course, if we manage to do this, uh, it does have very significant regional and national impact. And just imagine, as we are now talking in Hong Kong, one, one port in China, switching, mandating switching fuels, these sorts of things are being noticed by other Chinese ports. They are, in fact, being noticed by other Asian ports. So I also like to think it's possible to expedite other ports into thinking about this. And you know, because you have a sort of first mover advantage, um, we've done we've, we've done the research. We know how ships emit. Um, we can work out the health benefits. So this learning um, and working with the industry, this is something that is transferable to other ports. And we have other ports now coming to us. Um, you know, asking you know what are you what are you doing? We're we're actively also wanting to go and uh, and ship. So again, this is one way for us to play a role in, uh, in assisting the national challenge to reduce <coughs> air pollution. So uh, I'll just perhaps <coughs> take one more minute just to run through a couple of other things so you have a more complete picture, because right now, of course, I've just been talking about air pollution. Uh, we're also working on a new energy policy. Um, this is being, in a way, by the fact that our regulatory agreement with the two power utilities in Hong Kong, uh, they expire in 2018. And the contract requires us to have renewed uh, our commitment or, or to have arrived, <coughs> whatever we're going to agree on next, by the end of 2015. So we have, we're taking this opportunity to look at both <coughs> the supply side of energy, so shall we reduce the use of coal further, and what do we fill it up with? Gas, nuclear, so on the supply <coughs> side, we're going to think about that. And then on the demand side, how are we going to be much more energy efficient with our, our buildings? Um, I do see this as a very, very big task for Hong Kong, um, because it does give us a, an opportunity to, to re-look at energy. Uh, thirdly is we have a huge problem in waste. Hong Kong is extraordinarily wasteful. We think we have a crisis because our landfill is running out. We don't have a complete waste, uh, waste reduction, waste separation, waste treatment, and landfilling infrastructure yet. 
We have some bits of it, but not everything. So this government is going to commit billions of dollars to fill it out. But of course, it's always controversial when you're dealing with waste. Um, of course, people don't like to hear you're going to have to extend the landfills, particularly people who are not very far away. And treatment facilities, what kind of technology are you going to use? Uh, where are you going to put the thing? <coughs> now, where you put it is highly political. Uh, who would allow you to put it anywhere? So again, politically, we have to go through with, uh, I think, very tough discussions about, about siting of, of facilities. But we are going to spend billions of dollars. We have to do this. And we're very fortunate in Hong Kong that we can afford to pay for these. Um, but we must also work at reduction. Because that's, that's, really, that's really what it's all about. Um, and the last thing I want to say is uh, we have signed up through China a UN convention, the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity. I won't go into the details of this, but there's one part of it that is very unusual. Um, this convention has quite a detailed plan for signatories to work with the community on developing a protection plan for a conservation plan. And my colleagues are now looking through this and planning a whole one year of public engagement on how to talk to people, how to give people the information, how to engage stakeholders about protection. Because of course, protection, it does mean there are some no-go areas where you can't develop. There are other sensitive areas where you can, maybe, you know, where there's going to be a lot of arguments. There are going to be a lot of people coming forward to say, don't touch these areas. So essentially, these discussions can also serve uh, for us to have difficult discussions and debates about protection, conservation, and development. Uh, Hong Kong, as you know, is very built up. There isn't that many places you can go to where people are not going to object. And Hong Kong people are more and more passionate about conservation and environmental areas. So I feel it's very important to get forums, processes in place to be ready for these kinds of discussion. So maybe I can stop there. Okay. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, I, I want to let other people ask questions, but I was struck by the fact that you didn't mention water, which is clearly of immense importance, yes. not just in Hong Kong, but worldwide. I, I remember in 1981, I took a delegation of Middle Eastern specialists to China, and one of the professors on it was a water specialist, and it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody say, you know, everybody's so concerned about oil, but 20 years from now, we're going to be a hell of a lot more concerned about water and yes. lack of it and the freshness of it, etc. So, what is that? How is how much an issue is it in Hong Kong these days, and what are you thinking about doing? It? I think the problem for a lot of uh, people is, you know, you turn on the tap and water comes through. Uh, and again, China is so important. 80 percent of our water comes from across the border. We're very, very fortunate to be able to take water from one of the tributaries of the Pearl River. Um, we buy the water, and uh, we've been buying water since the 1960s, when we had a very, very major uh, drought in Hong Kong. And I think in the past, uh, you know, you can imagine, back in the 60s, the mainland was a much poorer place than it is today. So when Hong Kong signed a contract to buy water, uh, you know, this was uh, very significant. This was very good income for Guangdong. Now today, of course, um, many of the areas are quite wealthy themselves, and they're competing for water. And in fact, from the Dongzhan, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of counties and cities, including Guangzhou, they draw from the Dongzhan. And Hong Kong waters it, it only takes about 10 to 12 percent of that water. Um, we have definitely a huge interest in protecting the water quality of the Dongzhan. And in fact, beyond that, the whole of the Pearl River uh, Basin. As you can imagine, these are much more complicated discussions. I mean, you know, air pollution is complicated, but water pollution 
is even more complicated because, you know, it's kind of coming from the ground rather than sort of up there. Um, I didn't mention water pollution, not that it's not important, um, but we haven't cracked what to do about that yet. Um, I would like to see that we can find some ways of protecting the water using Hong Kong resources that are on the mainland. That is not easy. Spending money in whilst one country but somebody else's jurisdiction. But I think if we didn't do that, uh, maybe more difficult uh, to play a more active role. But as I said, I don't uh, haven't worked enough in that area as yet. Can you explain how that would work? You mean Hong Kong spending money in? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, actually, we have an example. We have an uh -huh. interesting example. Uh -huh. In 2008, the Hong Kong government proposed a small plan of 93 million Hong Kong dollars, which is I don't know, 12 million US dollars, which is um, not, not very much. Because it wasn't very much, I think the legislature was kind of happy to, to all right, let's see what happens. But the idea is, put a sum of money aside, this sum of money could be used to um, help raise the awareness of Hong Kong invested factories in uh -huh. the PRD. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly is they could do demonstration projects. So good demonstration projects hopefully would, uh, mm. would, would attract other people mm -hmm. to, uh, to do the same things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of training uh, of managers and people working in the factories. Now in those early days, I thought it was a very interesting project mm -hmm. right from the start, if they could work out all the logistics. Because again, can you work out a way to track who's doing what? And can you go actually and measure and say, well, you know, what did you really reduce? And can you do a lot? Mm -hmm. Now, the five-year program is over. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, it was over as I was joining the government. And when I was looking at the data, I said, wow, you know, this is great. Because the five years had worked out a process where we could track things. Um, we were then able to ask the legislature to give us a bit more money, another mm -hmm. 50 million Hong Kong dollars, to tie it over for the next two years. But what's really important is, when Hong Kong came up with this scheme, Guangdong was very pleased. I mean, it was a good thing to do. We were spending money over there to clean up factories that had Hong Kong investors. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Guangdong was so, I think, pleased with this program that they started their own. So they now have a much bigger program targeted at their own factories. Now, so these two things are running in parallel. And this is not part of the environmental, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is not part of the environmental departments uh -huh. uh, in Guangdong. Uh -huh. This uh -huh. is part of the commerce and industry guys, right? Mm -hmm. So it does open up another uh -huh. avenue of mm -hmm. protection. And in November, uh, I went up to Guangdong together with one of the vice governors to give out certificates, you know, to, uh, uh, it, you know, the, the guys who are performing very well. And I could see that this is one of those programs that have potential. Mm -hmm. So I am, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm making it a point to find out more about whether there are some programs in other parts of the world where you're spending your money in somebody else's jurisdiction. Uh, I'm told Finland is, ha has been doing it for years for projects in Russia. So I'm, uh, if there are other places that you know about, I'm keen to know about it. Secondly is I want to spend more time with the manufacturers, with uh, our counterparts in Guangdong, to think through what would be the next stage. Because in China, as you know, they make policies in five years, uh, five year plans. So the next one is the 13th five year plan, starting in 2016. So we have extended the scheme right, till 2015 to dovetail with the end of, uh, of the current five year plan. So we have two years to think about maybe something more innovative, something perhaps bigger. Um, so I'm 
so I guess that answers your yeah. question. Now for this plan, apart from air and energy, mm -hmm. uh, there were some water pollution improvements. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very keen to see what we can do on yeah. both air and energy and water. Mm -hmm. When you ask a question, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and where you're from. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Tim White. I'm from Columbia University. Could you could you describe what your authority and jurisdiction over water service in Hong Kong is? And if there's a separate water authority that isn't under your jurisdiction, what was it? What did their long term plan look mm. like? Okay, uh, the uh, I I'm responsible for water quality. There is another bureau, uh, and and the department under the bureau. Uh, that is in charge of buying water from China and piping it to Hong Kong. Um, the, I think the focus of policy so far has been to negotiate and secure water. Um, it hasn't extended to thinking about protecting the water sources and the watershed. So their horizon <coughs> typically was how long looking forward? Oh, well these are, uh, I mean these, these water contracts are, are long. Um, uh, there are obviously pricing, mm -hmm. uh, so you agree on a, a quantity and then the pricing is for a shorter period, you know, so you, you negotiate uh, periodically on the price. But they didn't see it as part of their mandate to in to watch out for future water quality? Well, actually what they've done is also quite interesting. Because they have to negotiate to buy the water, um, there's been discussion about where you take the water from. And some years ago, uh, when Guangdong was less rich than it is today, Hong Kong gave Guangdong a, an interest-free loan to create a, a kind of cover for the for the aqueduct that takes water to to Hong Kong. Now you could say that's very self-interested, uh, but nevertheless it created uh, again a new a, a new arrangement uh, of a, of a interest-free loan. So there's a lot of discussion and engineering about where you take water, how you pipe the water, the quality of the water that had to be assured that comes to the point of transfer. So there's a lot of knowledge about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dick Brady from Russell and Company. First, Gung Hei Fa Choi, thank you for spending a bit of your holiday with us. And snowstorm coming, you may be here a bit longer than you anticipated. Um, in years past, whenever the U.S. government has brought up environmental concerns for the Chinese government, my sense is the reaction has been, well, it's part of an American plot to retard the development of China, and we ought to, you know, resist it at all cost. And even uh, as recently as last year when our embassy was uh, releasing the pollution, air pollution readings in Beijing over a Twitter feed, again it was an American plot. Um, now I think it's sort of obvious, um, even to the people in Beijing, they've got a problem. But is there anything the American government should be doing to help them with this? Or should we just lay low and let folks like you in Hong Kong work this through with the experts in Beijing and let them reach their own conclusions? Well, to be honest, I don't know what the answer is because I'm not familiar with uh, you know, how the Americans and the Chinese at the diplomatic level are having these discussions. Um, I mean, we, we, we could all see some of the negotiations, for example, over climate change over, you know, over the years. And I think uh, when, you know, when two big powers talk to each other, there are many other perspectives beyond just dealing with uh, the problem. Now, however, um, I do see the US EPA officials, uh, their, their, their presence in Asia, uh, we certainly always <coughs> welcome them in Hong Kong uh, because US EPA officials have a breadth and depth of environmental uh, management that is very broad and very deep. 
many many officials, I think now including mainland environmental officials, have spent time studying in the US. Some of them have even spent time doing exchanges or you know, uh, they've had a period of time working in some corner of US EPA. So on a professional level, US EPA experience is highly valued in China, in Hong Kong, I think in Taiwan, you know, in, in, in Asia. Um, I don't want to talk out of school, but I just want to say that uh, uh, I think from the Asian perspective, we'd all like to continue to be able to work with US EPA. Now the US EPA, as I understand it, has an international division, which is the sort of outreach arm to help uh, people around the world. Um, I think I think they have some funding problems. <laughs> they have budgetary problems. Um, that is going to have an unfortunate impact on what they can do outside the US on a very practical basis to help people. Um, help their counterparts to uh, you know to to learn from their experience. I'll, I'll suggest to my congressman <laughs> that the U.S. EPA should be very welcoming of Asian delegations who <laughs> want to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and learn over our shoulders here, spending money in the U.S. Hopefully, they'll fly American Airlines when they come. To uh, Doug Murray, I've been with the National Committee in various roles for quite a while. Um, you have two examples of, of problems that just struck a chord with me. Solid waste. Last week, a couple of weeks ago, there was a wonderful segment on our news hour <coughs> about San Francisco and its attempt and its claim to be moving toward a zero waste system. And it was very, very persuasive given what they chose to cover. And I wondered if the San Francisco solid waste experience has been looked at by Hong Kong. And a similar case, probably different, and I know even less about it than I do about the San Francisco situation, is on water. It occurs to me that Hong Kong and Guangzhou are not totally dissimilar from New York City and New York State. And we have a situation here where New York spends a lot of money and time protecting the watershed hundreds of miles away and not without political problems mm. and based largely on agricultural runoff problems in the watershed that are part of the Hong Kong problem in Guangzhou. So I wonder if those are examples that you're aware have been studied at all by Hong Kong. Well, definitely the New York, uh, <coughs> the New York situation is very well known, um, and and I looked at it uh, in my previous uh, incarnation uh, on solid waste. We're actually looking at good examples from different parts of the world, and we are we we are planning a trip to Korea, to the city of Seoul. Um, our impression is that they've made very uh, great advances just in the last few years. And again, uh, in Taiwan, uh, the city of Taipei, they've made great advances in the last decade. Uh, Japan, obviously, is another Asian example that we're looking at. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're particularly interested in some of the Asian examples because one of the biggest segment of waste that we have is food waste. Um, Forty percent of our waste that today goes into landfill is food waste. And I think Asian food, um, Chinese food, our mix is different. So we're interested to see how other Asians are, mm -hmm. are dealing with it. Well, San Francisco comes the closest to being <laughs> Chinese food obsessed. Do you know what the similar numbers are for American cities in terms of what percentage of solid waste is food? No, I don't. Well, yeah, I have a question about wildlife. Um, 
the dolphins off Lantau and the projection of a, an expanded airport and the migrating birds at Maipo and elsewhere. Does either of those come under your jurisdiction? Thank you. And what has been the, the recent trend and what are the challenges that you <coughs> face now in preserving, enhancing wildlife? Well, uh, the pink dolphin, it's a really good example of um, that crystallizes what we have to do. And in fact, it's a very current issue. Um, the airport authority in Hong Kong has proposed to build a third runway. We have a two railway, uh, two railway, two air, two, two runway airport. They're proposing to build a third one. Now, of course, they're building it in very tight space. Um, and around that area, it's also where the pink dolphins uh, are swimming around it. Now, the, these big projects, they have to go through an environmental impact assessment study, which is happening now. Um, one of the concerns, uh, which may have a negative impact on whether the project can pass the EI, you know, the EIA process or not, uh, is about the, the pink dolphins. So uh, the project proponent, the airport authority, is giving some thought on what more they can be doing to protect the pink dolphins. Uh, our view at the Bureau is uh, it's best, if we really want to do a good job, what we have to do is really again collaborate with Guangdong because, you know, they're swimming across the boundary. And if we just look at protection, within our jurisdictional water, it's clearly not enough. Uh, if we could collaborate with Guangdong, then we have much more flexibility. Question mark again, um, how to start a discussion about the pink dolphins? Because it does require Guangdong to do something. Um, so these are the areas we're now beginning to, to explore. And on the bird migration, since you, it's clearly a <coughs> Hong Kong and China issue, and an issue since my paw is uh, right on the border with Shenzhen, um, what's the data about the uh, patterns and the extent of bird migration annually over the last while? The question, uh, Right now is, uh, I just happen to be talking to some of the bird experts. They're seeing an increase of birds at Maipo. What they don't know is what this means. Um, is it because we have a really nice place and they all want to come? Or is it that there are other places on their migratory path uh, that is in worse shape? So mm -hmm. more of them have to come to our place. Mm -hmm. Now, the question that we are also asking is, well, um, if more birds are going to come to Hong Kong, what, I mean, what can we accommodate? <laughs> we don't know yet. Hi, uh, Zach from Clinton Group. And my question is, do you know where China, mainland China is regarding the solid waste management? And are there any dialogues between the local government or even central government with Hong Kong? I think not. We're not talking to uh, uh, the central authorities or to Guangdong about uh, our waste problem, mm -hmm. basically because we think we've got to solve that ourselves. So mainly we've got to get Hong Kong people to reduce waste and we need to build out our uh, our infrastructure to mm -hmm. handle the waste, treat the waste, and you know, essentially there will still be something that we have to landfill um, and to deal with that. Okay. Uh, Alvin Lear, Pace Energy and Climate Center. Uh, you touched a little bit on it, but maybe you could speak more about energy uh, and decarbonizing energy supply. Um, you know, the level of commitment, and also. What, you know, what are the viable options? Because it's all very good to talk about decarbonization, mm -hmm. but 
commercially feasible options. So it's be interesting. Yes, yes. Um, well, our energy mix, our fuel mix right now is we buy electricity from China for 23% of our electricity use, and this comes from a nuclear power plant across the border. Uh, the rest, uh, it's, about, it's split between coal and natural gas. Right now, more coal than gas. So going forward, we're looking at whether we want to reduce uh, the use of coal. And to do that, uh, should we eliminate it altogether? Should we still have a small portion of coal? Um, should we, can we buy more new coal from China? Uh, or should we use more natural gas? Now, our natural gas essentially also comes from China. And the coal as well? The coal, no. The coal, uh, uh, because of air pollution control, um, we generally use something called cleaner coal, a lot, a very low sulfur coal, mm -hmm. and uh, the best coal of that kind comes from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So is there no push for renewable energy? Or? Well, uh, people assume because we're in um, the tropics that we have a lot of sun, mm -hmm. and because we have typhoon, we have a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. Uh, actually, about 10 years ago, one of the universities did quite a thorough study on our renewable capacity. And uh, within, again, Hong Kong's jurisdictional waters, there are only two relatively small spots where we can put up a wind farm. You know, big... Uh, uh, <coughs> only two spots. Um, and together, they would produce maybe one maximum two percent of our needs, mm -hmm. but they'll be very expensive. So, question: You know, do we want to go ahead with that? Now, this of course doesn't take into account whether in future we can buy from China. Question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, doing it ourselves is fairly limited. Now, we look at solar because we generally have a. Uh, uh, we have quite a lot of cloud cover, so again, it's not ideal. But we, like in New York, we have tall buildings, and you kind of put it on the rooftop, and it doesn't really generate enough, <coughs> as a, at least with current technology. So we have relatively few smaller houses where you can put it on the roof, but that's relatively little. So again, wind and solar is not so ideal for Hong Kong. It's uh, old indeed from West England. I have a suggestion uh, which would be quite difficult to implement, I admit. But more than 60% uh, of the industry in Guangdong province is actually Hong Kong owned. And the pollution, the air pollution that's produced, uh, if the wind is going the right direction, comes to Hong Kong. Um, and both Chinese and uh, Hong Kong law allows uh, the fining or punishment of a, a tort visa um, if the tort is committed outside of your jurisdiction but it comes in. If you could convince um, the provincial authorities to uh, essentially turn over to you <coughs> Um, examinations of when a Hong Kong owned factory is polluting, you could find them in Hong Kong, thereby producing the funds to get back to China to do all the cooperative work. Um, the big problem is that most of those factories that aren't receiving your certificates today for being the good guys are uh, managing to stay out of trouble by bribing the local EPA. Uh, so if you did it though with the provincial authorities, uh, they might be more anxious to um, cooperate with you and, and tell you. And you'd only be finding the head office. Um, now there would probably be uh, some in industry in Hong Kong that wouldn't like that idea, but it is an idea. Mm. Certainly an idea. 
uh, it would be an idea that I guess also has to be cleared in uh, Beijing uh, because there, there are jurisdictional issues in, involved. Um, whereas I, I guess if we were looking at subsidies and the other way, you know, the softer way, mm. then it's more welcoming. Uh, but uh, I mean, of course, uh, uh, the other thing that probably we want to do is whether we want to. Re I mean, I'm, I'm just asking as I'm thinking about your pro your your suggestion, whether we want to do that. I think the Hong Kong the Hong Kong government also has to ask whether I want to regulate across you, you know something across the border. But you wouldn't be regulating it. It re really would be the Guangdong EPA that would notify Hong Kong of when a Hong Kong owned factory had uh, violated Chinese um, pollution rules, which are in fact pretty good uh, on paper. And uh, then you would decide in Hong Kong whether or not to find the head office. Right. Um, I think as you can well imagine being a very senior lawyer, the layer of complexity of how I would find, right? So I think the punishment side will obviously be very complicated. <coughs> Um, we are now actually three minutes past our switching hour, but I, I do want to ask one question which I, is, has been raised in my mind listening to a lot of your responses, and that is your level of an, uh, level of relationship and ability to initiate relationships between you and your colleagues in Hong Kong and your environmental colleagues who work in the governments, not just in Guangdong and regional areas, but elsewhere. I, I expected to hear more from you that, yes, we do work closely with the EPA here, there, and even in Beijing. But it sounded more like there were there was some caution in terms of initiating, who's going to initiate it, how will it be received. And are there any restraints on you, either put on by the Hong Kong government or your perception that the restraints would be on the Hong Kong of the PRC side that you don't do more of this? Or do you, your answer before was we have to solve our own problems first? Is that what's driving? Oh no, well, I, I I think it's 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 absolutely important that I can show I'm solving my own problems first. So I mean, for example, even in air pollution, where there's a a, a lot of regional pollution, um, it. If I can't solve the stuff that is closest to people's nose in Hong Kong, I will not be protecting the health of the Hong Kong people because that's where they get the biggest hit. That's why we have to deal with the vehicles and the ships because this is where, the, I mean, is the greatest harm to the people living in Hong Kong. So obviously the next level is the regional stuff. And uh, I, I, I actually don't, have any hesitation to connect with colleagues across the border to see. But I think the attitude that I have is I'm genuinely interested in them. Um, may maybe because I started off my, uh, my career in Beijing, right? <laughs> Owen was there. Um, and I, I just don't have a hesitation in uh, working across, across the border. Um, now, with um, with Owen's idea, it's much more complicated. H hence, my hesitation. <laughs> not not because I hesitate to to deal with the mainland. Well, thank you, Chris, for coming. Yeah.